So, if I can get my papers in order. Uh, thank you all very, very much. Uh, thank you, Joseph, for arranging everything. Thank you, my students, some of you, my teachers, some of you, people I have learned from, and people who I'm meeting for the first time. Uh, you said that there's still stuff to be done in law and economics. I certainly think so. Indeed, I've just signed a contract for a book. I wrote down 300 pages uh, just of a draft. It may be baloney, but it's on paper. Uh, and uh, with the Yale Press called The Future of Law and Economics. So I think that there is still a significant future and things to be said. Uh, one side comment on French and Italian wine. Uh, long after everything I have written, everything you all have written will be gone, one of my great achievements will survive. I talked one of the colleges, one of the oldest colleges in Cambridge, to increase their wine cellar beyond French wine and some German wine to include Italian wine. And that will last long after we're all gone. So we should put our achievements in perspective. Okay. Today, I want to talk about something a little to the side of what this conference is, but I think you'll see how it relates to it. I call it the place of law of torts in law and economics, the significance of the liability rule. Now, recent years have seen a resurgence of the view of torts as a pri purely private legal arrangements. Whether it's described in terms of compensatory justice, Jules Coleman, the right of an injured party to be made whole, or redress for civil wrongs, Goldberg and Zipersky, the right of an injured person to get back at the one who injured him or her, these views reject those of the system builders, as Itzhak Englard felicitously called us, those of us who view torts as part of a legal, political, economic structure of a polity. This public view of torts has been dominant at least since my first article. And Blum and Calvin's answer, Marciano has done a good deal of work on that, aptly titled Public Law Perspectives on a Private Law Problem. It is of the relationship between these approaches and of the inevitability of the public law and economic view of torts that I wish to speak today. In doing so, I want to correct, though, an error that many system builders have made, myself included, that is of viewing torts and its cognates, eminent domain and other such things, as second best ways of mimicking markets. That is of using that as ways of mimicking markets when markets won't work or are not available. I want to claim a more interesting role, economic role, for torts than that. Interestingly, the new privatists distinguish torts from contract and criminal law by recognizing the public role of the latter, of criminal law and contract, and ignoring their private law, and suggesting instead that torts has only a private role. And they say, if my relationship between victim and injurer are gone, torts is dead. They actually say that. I think that's silly. Torts survives and is alive and well in a system like New Zealand's, that is the public function of torts, in a system like New Zealand where the victim-injurer relationship is destroyed completely. But let's look at their strangely limited view of contract and criminal law. They view that contract as a way, as a market way of regulating the shifting of entitlements. What is mine and what is yours solely by consent, and surely contract does that. And criminal law is a command, collective way 
of regulating entitlements, what is mine and what is yours, by collective decision. And that surely is so. That's the public role of contracts and criminal law. But this ignores a private role of contracts, keeping promises, private human agreements. Why what was called the Holmesian heresy is a heresy. What was a Holmesian heresy? Holmes said that people had a right to break a contract if it was cheaper to break the contract than to follow through on it. And all sorts of people called it a heresy. Now, why did they do that? In a purely public role, Holmes, of course, was right. But what he was saying, but the people who called it a heresy were saying that in some sense, once a contract is entered into, people come to expect something of it privately, and to destroy that is to destroy something too. Similarly, it ignores the private role of criminal law, the right of a victim to invoke the state to punish those who have wronged him. Consider all the victim's rights processes, why the death penalty exists in the United States, which has nothing to do with deterrence, it has nothing to do with any of those things which have been long shown to be not there, but it re remains because of this private notion of my right to get back at him. I don't like it, but the fact that I don't like it doesn't mean it isn't there. Also, it explains why Becker is wrong when he suggests that the only reason for the criminal penalty being more than uh, what was stolen is the multiplier effect, that you don't catch somebody all the time. That ignores a private role of criminal law. To view criminal and contract in this public entitlement defining and shifting functions only is to ignore a significant part of those areas of law. Once relationships are established so that entitlements can change only by consent, or that entitlements can change only when the collectivity decides that they can change, people come to expect some relationships, and those relationships become to have value in and of themselves. And this private side of each of these fields is closely important. And that means that if you only looked at the public side, you would lose something. Now, are these private values, which they emphasize in torts, ones that we can't speak about in economic terms? That's nonsense. Of course we can speak about them in economic terms. They don't, but there is a value that now attaches because people's utilities, to put it in truth, in unfelicitous economic language, suffer when promises are not kept, or my utility suffers if I don't get back at a victim. We can put those, uh, or my utility suffers if uh, the one-on-one -on -one relationship that they make so much of is destroyed. Of course we can put those in economic terms too. They don't, but we can. But it is a different level of economic than the public side, which people like me and the system builders have been concerned about. And so it is in torts, except that here, the Kohlberg-Gorskis, as I like to call them, uh, aggregation is something that we sometimes do in law and economics and sometimes don't do. The Kohlberg-Gorskis say that there, in torts, it is only the private. And perhaps some law and economics people have acted as if there's only the public side in torts. I haven't, and surely Blum and Calvin didn't way back then. So what is the public side? I have said it before. It is the liability rule. It is the societal decision to let entitlements be shifted, not solely by private agreement, nor solely, as in contract, nor solely by collective fiat, but by private decisions in which the price of the shift is collectively set. Notice the difference. Contracts, private decision entirely. Collectivity, the collectivity decides what is mine, what is yours. The liability rule says you can act privately, 
but you have to pay a collectively set price, not the price you agree on. And in this respect, torts is only one of several fields that are part of this liability rule system. Eminent domain, privately given eminent domain, are the most obvious. Okay. I've elsewhere written that this has always been available in all societies, whether they are libertarian or collectivist, for practical reasons. That is, there are some things that cannot be handled collectively, even in the most collective societies, and so they use the liability system. There are some things that cannot be handled by contract. It's too expensive to contract, even in the most collectivist, in the most uh, libertarian society. But even more important, even if any given thing could be handled, either through contract or in a, in a libertarian society or through collective decision making in a collectivist society, you can't handle them all because collective decision making gets less and less good as you do too much of it and the requirements for contractual libertarian dealing, the knowledge required for it, gets more and more expensive as you try to do too much, so there becomes a kind of comparative advantage question of what you want to have decided in one way and what you want to have decided in another way. You may be able perfectly well to decide better than in any other way how many shoes are produced. But since you can't decide everything collectively, even the collectivist is likely to say as to shoes, let it be done in some more private way because there's more of a comparative advantage to deciding other things collectively. Okay. What is interesting, and I've said this before, is that in many modern societies, the United States and most Western societies today, the liability rule, way of doing it, is used when it need not be. It is used when we could perfectly well, if we wanted to, decide by contract the shifting of entitlements or decide collectively. That is, it is used when the cost of entering into a contract is low because we're already there. Medical malpractice, where it doesn't work well anyway, <laughs> workers' compensation, where you do have a contractual relationship, product liability, it is used in any number of areas where we could use contracts if we wanted to. But evidently, we, the society, doesn't. And these are areas also where, by and large, you could regulate collectively. In an odd way, this is the analog of the public role of contract in criminal law. That is, when by choice we decide to let entitlements be shifted by contract, when by choice we decide to determine them collectively, and when by choice we decide to let them be shifted in this mixed method in which the collectivity sets the price and then the parties take the actions that they wish. How the collective price is set, or better, what does the collectivity do and mean to do in deciding what that price will be is what I want to focus on today. It's interesting and it speaks wonders about the early system builders, myself included, and their economics, and their therefore unspoken pro-market biases, that much early liability rule analysis, my own included, viewed it as trying to mimic the market. Liability rules as remedying market failures. You use it where there are large number problems. You use it where there are transaction cost problems. And you try to do, through the setting of the price, 
what the contract would do if contracts could be entered into. You try to do that. You try to set the price so that the exchange would be the one that would have occurred if there were no transaction costs. And often you would set the person on whom the liability would be in that way that lessened the transaction cost to correct your error. The whole object was to try to get as close to the market result because we were all market oriented. And at times, of course, that is exactly what the liability rule does. But viewing it that way is an impoverished view of both law and economics. There is nothing that requires the view that entitlements should be shifted only and if that is what was consensually desired by the parties. After all, we do have collective de determination and command enforcement. That is, there are many things that people want to have determined collectively. So why should we be mimicking the market necessarily? Maybe because I like it, but that doesn't mean the society likes it. As a purely theoretical matter, moreover, and with appropriate knowledge assumptions, as <laughs> Medima will say in his paper uh, about me, that there was a nifty shift, he says in the middle of his paper, uh, of saying, with perfect assumptions, you reach perfect results collectively just as much as you do uh, individually. And by the way, it was the essence for those of you who happen to remember of Kaplow's tenure piece in which he said, there is no reason to give compensation in eminent domain if you know that it is worth it or not. Of course not. If you have perfect knowledge, you don't need any of them. Or as both me and and, and Sunstein have said about paternalism, under perfect knowledge, it doesn't matter whether you're paternalistic or not, he's about to give the store's lectures at Yale, and I think that's what he's going to say at greater length, given his title, I haven't heard it, but the title, Paternalism and Human Error, suggests to me that what it's going to say again. Okay. What this, but why would we want to have this third party collective determination. Why would we want to have that? Here, I think we get into something else which is linked to what I will say much more of in my, uh, in my book. And that is, why would we not want to mimic the market and what the two parties would decide? It is because the collectivity evidently thinks there are some things that are desirable that are not captured in the contract negotiation. And if you speak to collectivists, they never speak of those in economic terms. They always speak of the desires of a collectivity or something like that. If we want to speak about them in economic terms, I think we have to speak about the utility effects on third parties about the fact that a negotiation between two people to shift an entitlement may have third party effects because of which the collectivity enters and sets a price to take those into account. Now, at that point you start sounding as if you are mimicking the market again, but you're mimicking a very different market from the one that Traditionally, we did when we said we try to get to the point where the two parties would do this. And by the way, this fact of third-party utility effects is behind any number of fascinating things, and it's behind one of the things that I will, I'm doing in this book. For instance, the existence of so-called merit goods. Why do we have goods that people do not want to have allocated according to the prevailing wealth distribution? Because some people are offended by it. And the people who are offended by it have as much right to that offense and to introducing it into things. Okay. So, one could equally well view the liability rule as approaching or trying to do by private penalties what we can't achieve by total collective mandate, by criminal law. 
And of course, some liability rules with huge non-insurable punitive damages are sort of mimics of criminal law. That is, there are times when the liability rule in practice tries to do in a different way what criminal law can't do, and so we do it through the liability rule because that's what we want. Think of punitive damages or treble damages or quadruple damages in antitrust situations or in RICO situations where we don't trust the criminal law system to do it, but we want to do what the criminal law system wants, and therefore we do it by using liability rules to make the entitlement shift extraordinarily difficult. So sometimes the liability rule mimics markets, the libertarian contract. Sometimes it mimics criminal law, and that is punitive damages which are not there for the multiplier effect, the becker sharkey thing of when people don't get caught, uh, or punitive damages that are not there to take into account the extra market value that somebody may put on something because it is his. You know, Viscusi said at one point that it was wrong, I don't know that he said irrational, for people to get punitive damages when their luggage was lost uh, by airplanes. Uh, well, I don't know if it's right or wrong. If I love my luggage so much that I want to put extra value on it, why shouldn't that, my peculiar utility, be taken into account just as much as if I love my private parts? And I certainly can get punitive damages if airplanes destroy them in a way. Uh, that is, there is this other side of purely contractual mimic the market punitive damages, like Sharkey's, which is a perfectly explainable in contract terms. But beyond that, beyond either the criminal or the contractual one is something else. If we view the liability rule the collectively set price at which an entitlement can be shifted, not as second best libertarianism, nor as second best collectivism, but as an ideological middle ground chosen by the polity because it wants that middle ground, the damages awarded become not a mimic, but a decision in itself. A decision by that social democratic polity, which I may like or may not like, to decide how easy and in what circumstances does that democratic, social democratic society want to make it for you to take from me what is mine or how difficult we want it to make for you to do that. And that may be for collective desire reasons. Now, as I said, we can term those collective desire reasons taking into account third-party utilities and discuss that in good economic terms, and I inevitably will do that because I can't help myself. That's the kind of economic -y person I am. Uh, I'm sure that Dworkin would say I'm nuts, but I've said he was nuts many years and many times, so that's all right, too. Uh, viewed this way, one can understand all sorts of things about torts and damages and eminent domain too. Okay, there are times when in fact we set damages below what the real mimicking contract would do. Emotional damages, fanciful damages, purely economic damages. Now sometimes we do that for market mimicking ways, and I don't have time today to go into when those are, but there are certainly times when we do that for market mimicking ways. But there are also times when we do it that way because we want to encourage the shift in entitlements. We want to make it easier. We want to encourage people to do things which take what is mine away from me or engage in activities that will do that 
rather than do the price that would be the negotiated contract price. We want to encourage it for whatever societal broader reasons. Uh, all the times when we do not give punitive damages where Sharkey and multipliers would say that we should are situations where that happens. And there are times instead when through punitive damages or allowing runaway juries to give more damages than what would be the market correct ones, and after all, it's our choice to allow such juries to do it, we do the opposites. We want to let individuals decide to take my entitlement, but only if they are willing to chance a very high price, a price that is higher than the price that would be the negotiated interdose between the two of us price. Why? For good or for bad social democratic reasons. Two examples of this from eminent domain will make this crystal clear, I hope. In Italy, for a very long time, I don't know if still, eminent domain compensation paid not market value of land, but value in use. How you were using the land, not its market value. So that if I was using my land as an ancestral farm or estate, even though the value in the market would be much higher because this could be developed, it could be taken either by public eminent domain or private eminent domain for the value in use. Why? Because the collectivity decided that even though I wanted it used that way, there was some more general social good, which could be put in economic terms or not, but which allowed it to be taken from me paying the lower price. I know that all too well because my great uncle, a great economist, had lands outside Bologna and he actually was waiting until the development got to the point, he was an economist, where the price was highest. He was not aware of the law of value in use and somebody looked and said, oh my goodness, we need to build an airport in Bologna and look at all this empty land that is there and so my great uncle's land was taken for value in use and I'm a lot poorer for it. He had no children. I'm well enough off. All to, I mean, I'm, I can't argue with a social democrat. Every time I land in Bologna, I say, fine, but let's understand that they didn't pay what that was market worth. The other side came up recently in uh, an eminent domain case the Kilo case, in which uh, private developers were able to take people's houses in New London under the Connecticut law at the market value of these. And this caused an enormous storm, enormous storm. All sorts of conservatives were saying that the court was being activist by letting the legislature do what it wanted. Some misterms in that. Uh, but they were getting at something that somehow it was thought that when private developers had use of eminent domain, they should not be able to take the land paying what would have been a market price, that there was something wrong with that. Conceive of Kilo if the eminent domain price had been four or five times, if the rule were that when you take for a private development, you may have eminent domain, but only if you pay four or five times the objective market price. The attitude would have been very different. And that was because there are evidently some collective values which can be put in economic terms for that. The interesting thing is if you read, and I have here the argument before the Supreme Court on that, Justice Kennedy, in his questioning, says, but wouldn't it be all right? Couldn't we do it by making them pay more? And everybody says, that's not the law, that's not the law. But of course it could be the law. And Justice Kennedy was focusing exactly in his questioning. It didn't appear in the opinions, but it is in the questioning at argument. My point of all this 
is not only to right a wrong in which I early took part on what a liability rule is and does in practice, that is, of correcting the notion that a liability rule is only a market mimicker. Well, that would be enough to justify this talk. It is also to explain to the Kohlberg-Gurskis why torts and its cognates, like contract and criminal law, have a crucial public law economic structure significance from any one-on-one -on -one relationship. Each of the things I've described could and would find their place in New Zealand or other system that separated the collectively set price that the entitlement taker paid from the collectively set remuneration that the entitlement loser received. And here I just want to make a parenthetical. What I am saying here is just a small part of what I mean to do in this book I'm writing, which is to try to look at what happens in the world, what kinds of rules of law we have, which are not explained by traditional and simple economic theory, and then say, is the problem with the real world that it is wrong, or is the problem that we are not looking at the world correctly, as with the fourth rule in the cathedral, that we were only looking at appellate cases and not something else, or is the problem that the economic theory is not sophisticated enough? And that is what I call law and economics as against the economic analysis of law. It is a back and forth between the two. And it is, of course, what Coase did first and foremost in the nature of the firm, where he said, if markets were costless, there would be no firms, but there are firms. So what does that tell us about the cost? Can economic theory adapt to that? That's what I want to do in this book in any number of different ways. In this that I'm talking about here is only one small part of it. Okay, so I'll close where I began. There is truth in what the revisionists say, that there is a private side of tort, eminent domain, liability rules, social democratically governed rules of, uh, of law, just as there is in contracts and criminal law, and just as there is there a system building public side of each. Once for public policy reasons, one decides that entitlements can be shifted in certain circumstances, in certain ways, people's expectations follows, and people's sense of right and rights versus others do too. So that whether it is because we have set up a contract system, or a criminal law system, or a liability rule system, once we have that, people come to expect certain things, and when they expect those things, it is costly not to follow that to those people. And that is what the private law torts people are emphasizing, and they're right to emphasize that, but it's only a small part. And it is equally true in contracts and criminal law. And then one loses something of crucial importance if one ignores that individual rights created. Holmes's heresy is a heresy, but only in part. Criminal law is in part about victim rights, as well as public ordering. And so is torts about the people, individual expectations to get compensation or to get back at somebody, but only in part. And the question is, is the cost of not following that part, of getting rid of that part, high or low in relation to the public ordering part that we want? Is it cheaper to get rid of that private and deal with it in some other way? Not through torts, but through other things in contracts or, or through non-insurable torts or any number of other ways that we can try to deal with those public ex private expectations if the public part of doing it in one of these three ways 
is more important in terms of reducing the costs of the harm as against the costs of safety. What these relative costs are and when it is worth doing one or the other is for another paper in another place and almost certainly by somebody else. At my age, I'm more here to set agendas for other people to do research than to do it myself, to suggest to people what they might do. Uh, for today, my point is to glory in the liability rule and its sovereignty in large areas of our legal economic system. In its own right, as a reflection of our, for better or worse, ideologically mixed social democratic societies, where for any number of reasons, we want to have entitlements shift, not solely when people would do it by interdose contract, not solely as a result of collective fiat, but when the collectivity decides how easily or how difficult, difficultly, for its own reasons, entitlements should be sifted. And what that means for the central role of torts and its cognates in law and economics today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guido. As usual, when I'm listening to your speeches or I'm reading your things, then I need uh, several weeks, possibly months, for uh, thinking about. Uh, I mean, and I'm always going back to school in the sense that I'm becoming a student again. And, but thank you very much for this thoughtful uh, speech. Now it's question time. We want to, to discuss, as usual, with colleagues, so please. Uh, Teach, I don't ask questions from the podium. I go and ask questions next to people, and my students think I'm being very nice for the first two weeks until I tell them that the reason I do it is that otherwise I couldn't hear them. But by then, they're taken in, and so it works. So please, if there are questions about this or any of the other things, you know, there's been much said about my work. This is an opportunity to ask things, and be careful, because if you don't ask things, I may call on you. Would be nice see if anyone is also presenting herself or himself when, when raising questions. Don't be afraid. Uh, so, uh, you're, you're, uh, put this thing on because then I will hear with this, I hear very well. So, you're, you're, new move here of, of describing the liability rule as uh, potentially involving uh, damage awards that are either lower or higher than the market price to, based on a collective decision of whether to encourage or discourage the shifting of entitlements. Uh, that's interesting. The, the question I have is, um, given that we're talking about common law processes here, decentralized decision making, let's say for a moment that we we're in a situation where we want to encourage the shifting of the entitlement so that we're setting damages below the market level. Um, I'm wondering what the mechanism is by which courts are going to settle on the, the appropriate amount. Um, are, are, do you imagine a process where they figure out what's the correct amount and then they're just having it? Or how, how, what's, the, what's the path that leads to a, a, a given level of damages in, in a situation like this? In a way, it's easier in eminent domain because then it is set most of the time by legislature. Although the reason I mentioned 
uh, Kilo and Kennedy's questioning because uh, even a court, even the Supreme Court that is so far removed from uh, individual common law situations and understands almost nothing about torts, uh, strangely, the two justices in the Supreme Court who understand most about it are Ginsburg and Thomas. I didn't teach Thomas, so I can say that. Uh, but uh, even that court saw that there. Now, you know, the question of how um, courts get at things that are economically right or are economically right for that society is something that has been the source of a great literature, you know, beginning with the efficiency of the common law, there are reasons that push in that direction. Ultimately, I don't know quite how it works. The fact is, though, that the really great judges, having seen a lot of cases, start to ref understand in an odd way what that society wants and then judge acting on judge does come out that way. And so I think one can in retrospect say, why are damages so low here? Why are damages so high here? And remember that this is all common law and legislative so that if we get it wrong, of course there's legislative inertia, but the legislature can say, no we want the thing higher, no we want it lower, so that there is a second look. But judges do somehow manage. And I'll just tell you one strange example uh, of judges on this. Many, many years ago, I had occasion to see it because by way of his decision being taken up by the Ninth Circuit, being taken up by California, being taken up by Guam, it became a case, a law that I had to apply a few years ago, was a decision in a proximate cause case uh, well, uh, no, I'm sorry, in, in, um, a, uh, uh, in a master-servant liability case of intentional wrongdoing by the servant by Henry Friendly. And in that decision, he cites, uh, because his law clerk, Bruce Ackerman, had been my student, some of the new work in law and economics that some character named Calabresi was doing. I just started writing. And then he says, that's very interesting, but I want to come out a different way. I don't think I can come out that way. The interesting thing to me is that he got it right. Ackerman, though he understood he had been my student, and it's Ackerman, no less, got it wrong. Uh, that judge, from his experience, somehow understood that. Now, how does it happen? Now that I'm a judge, I'd like to think it's because we're all so great. I don't know. I don't know. I'd like to think more in terms of a kind of George Priest, uh, the discussion of it. There are something in the structure of a common law development that leads to results that reflect that, but I can't be sure. Uh, excuse me, I, I belong to the University of Economics here in Prague. And uh, you must have thought of um, impacts of your thought on um, insurance, and, uh, in particular because this is such a heavily regulated industry. So are there any direct yeah. implications on that? I think that most people who speak about insurance, at least in the United States, don't understand insurance at all. Uh, they'd like to blame insurance and insurance companies for any number of things, which is not their fault, whatever. Uh, one has to understand that insurance companies are essentially the house in a gambling situation. Uh, so long as there is zero and double zero, so long as they know what the rules are, they are happy. They are unhappy if the law changes in ways that they stop being the house and become gamblers. They then start to charge huge entrepreneurial premiums. Entrepreneurial premiums are always high. It's the essence of capitalism, is what Frank H. Knight and what my great uncle in Italy said, profits are the return for taking uninsurable risk. Not monopoly rents, it's, it's 
taking that and winning. Uh, but you pay entrepreneurs highly, and we want to. You especially pay them highly if what the people you make be insurers, be I mean, entrepreneurs, are people who are risk averse. And insurance companies are risk averse, and we want them to be risk averse. We don't want them to go broke. So when you make insurance companies become entrepreneurs, it's going to be very expensive, which is the essence of a malpractice crisis in the United States, that we've done that, and the result is stupid. The effect of all of this on insurance companies is crucial, because if we do it right, so that insurance companies can know what the risks are and can take it into account in prices, insurance companies then become those who convert all of these non-quantified, non-quantifiable things into things which are quantified and quantifiable, and then use them in ways that create precisely the kinds of incentives that people react to. And it is that mechanism that it is at the core of what Ken Abraham said was my contribution in my first article of talking about how deterrence became important even with insurance, which my teacher, Fleming James, thought was not there, but that instead I said precisely because insurance converts this into category deterrences, category incentives, if it is done right, it works and is fundamentally important. We have to be careful how we do it, because if we do it wrong, then we make insurance companies be something that they are not, and then we all pay the price. But it is the essence of uh, what we are about. Uh, because if you just talk of these as we do in the way common law courts will do it, it does not become something that can be used. And I'd like just to give you one very odd example of how the decision of courts can be turned into decisions of insurance. Demsitz, one of the truly great economists and inadequately recognized, I mean, I'll just say it here, I think if Becker deserved the Nobel Prize, Demsitz deserved it five times over because he wrote five times as many articles as were new. I'm not saying Becker didn't deserve it, but I'm just saying that Demsitz wrote any number of articles that were truly novel in that. Uh, knew only one rule of law, and that rule of law was wrong. The rule of law that he knew was that if you, in a car, crash into the rear of another car, you are liable. That isn't the law. The law, which Holmes would have wanted to be that way, and some early cases went, got changed so that no you can show that you were acting reasonably even if you ran into somebody's rear. But the fact of the matter is that insurance companies will always settle the case in which somebody runs into somebody else's rear because the number of times when it is so unlikely, and the number of times when you could convince a court or a jury that you were not negligent or contributorily negligent when you run into somebody's rear is so small that it isn't worth the insurance company's cost of fighting it. So the insurance companies has converted this highly subtle rule, which may have an effect in the case in which Viscusi uh, runs into Calabresi's car, which is full of Guido dynasty vases of immense value because Guido stupidly stops for no reason, which might be the case in which the insurance company wouldn't settle. And the law provides for that possibility by saying it's not an absolute rule. And yet, as a practical matter, in terms of incentives, the insurance companies have done their job of saying that case is about as likely as a case in which torture is justified.
assertion to think that market price cannot capture all the value. As I understand from your example about the, about the airport, there are two values use value. Sometimes use value can underestimate or overestimate the market price. But you are opening a Pandora box because this was already existing in the classical economic thought. And I've always been very fascinated by it because this one was the problem. I remember one of the when I used it several years ago for a paper said, but why aren't they the same? So that's it is one of the problems. How can you manage use value with market value? Because market value is easy to be calculated. Use value is difficult. Uh, okay. Uh, it does open a Pandora's box because it says uh, if you view eminent domain as not being a mimicker of the market, then you'd better start asking yourself, what is it that is wanted, and why? And is it a good idea? The fact that it is in fact done that way tells me something about that society. Do I myself think that it is better for eminent domain to mimic the market? Well, especially given what happened to my great uncle, I would say yes. But the fact is that uh, that society at that time evidently thought that the fact that somebody who viewed himself for aristocratic reasons as wanting to own a great deal of land even though it could be developed in other ways and was going to keep it that way, was costing that society something. And that society chose to give to the, collect to the collectivity or to whoever wanted to take it the right to take that entitlement for much less. Now, you say that opens a Pandora's box. Of course. But so does straight collective decision-making. So would a determination in a collectivist society of we want this land and we will take it without compensation, which of course a collectivity would be completely free to do. And Kaplow said, why not? So, you know, it is not that I am opening a Pandora's box. What I am saying is that the liability rule is in fact used in societies in ways that make it much more problematic for all us traditional cost mimicking economists do. And since it is done that way, we had better ask whether there are ways of incorporating this into economic theory so that we who do think that way can get some control over it or if we can't, in which case we have to say, sorry, we economists have nothing to say, and what happens in most of the world then gets decided by philosophers, or worse, by sociologists. <laughs> and, you know, I then have some problems with that. That is, I think that there are some things that we can say by, just as what Coase said, can we talk about markets being costly, can we economists then say something about all sorts of things? And the answer is yes. And I think that is true in any number of different things. And just by way of dramatic hint, one of the things in this book that I'm doing is to say that economists, as economists, doing what economists do can tell us something even about what tastes are in an economic sense more desirable than others. Something that economists have always said they cannot do. But I think I can demonstrate and do that there are, maybe limited, but something that economists can say about that, which is something that wouldn't it be wonderful rather than leaving it to people who say, I know all about taste, who don't say, give us any guidance, whatever. Thank you very much. I think you have a question? Yeah, yeah. We had this slight delay, so I think we can go. A number of states in the United States have passed laws uh, limiting
damages of various kinds, such as non-economic damages. So which do you view as the more authentic expression of the collective will? Is it the laws that restrict damages, or is it the decentralized actions by juries that award damages? Uh, you asked juries and legislatures, and it's interesting that you skipped courts, uh, because uh, both juries and legislatures are in some ways uh, representative of the people. They are representative in different ways. Uh, juries are representative looking only at this situation and comparing it with what they think happens generally, which is often misinformation, often by the other side. You know, when, uh, when people on the defense side talk about how outrageous it is that huge damages have been given to somebody who has spilled coffee on herself, whether that's the correct case or not, doesn't matter, then a jury that sees somebody who has really been injured is going to give ten times the damages because they say, jeepers, if somebody who has spilled coffee on herself gets this much, it must be just for us to do this. They are representative in that sense. Legislatures are representative in a very different sense. Repre legislatures do not represent people who are not repeat players. It is not worth my while as somebody who has been damaged to go to the legislature and ask for reform. So that tort reforms are almost always a compromise between injurer categories who are repeat players and plaintiff's lawyers who are repeat players. The plaintiffs aren't there. Now, that is not a bad compromise, but it leaves out of the picture somebody else. The juries reflect almost always only the person who is lying there injured. Which is better? Uh, I think sometimes one, sometimes the other. And in that, I don't have the experience of a trial lawyer, but I will say this to you. My father-in-law, uh, my wife's father, was a very, very great trial and appellate lawyer in a small town in New Haven. Uh, he was always on the side of the insurance company and the defense. That was the kind of lawyer that he was. When he was old, he told me, I asked him about juries, and others, and he said, I have lost many cases to courts and to juries, and on liability, I've got to tell you, I think juries got it right most of the time. On damages, I don't think they did. That is, his experience on one side was that on liability, juries reflected more what was wanted, on damages he thought not. And that may be the answer to your question. Uh, my own experience now, 18 years, as an appellate judge, makes me think he may well have been right. But that's a very, you know, an appellate judge, federal appellate judge has distance on that. I must say, the only time that I ordered a remitted tour in a damage situation, because it seemed to me that the jury had gone wild, the Supreme Court reversed me. Another Hello. Uh, you, you gave a few examples of where the tort law is being used, even though you thought that the contract law should be used. It was the product liability, medical malpractice. Now, one can easily construct other examples where, say, the criminal law is being used while the tort law would be better, perhaps even where the contract law is used now while the tort law would be better. So. In an overall, you know, judgment, do you think the tort law as being used today is being used too little, too much, or if it should expand, uh, where would you start? Um, so, I don't think I said where tort law is being used where contract law should be used. I said tort law is being used where contract law could be used. Uh, that is, uh, I think uh, I didn't take a normative position on that. 
uh, I think it is clearly the case that today we use this middle ground where you could use a more collectivist or a more libertarian way. Which is best is not, I think, a, a question that one can answer generally. First one has to say, what is the nature of our polity? Uh, when I was growing up, I think it clearly was the case that the United States was becoming more social democratic. Uh, you know, not uh, Atlee style collectivist, let alone Russian style collectivist, but not libertarian. Today, there is a strong move in the direction of a more libertarian, less social democratic polity. And the whole decision in elections will tell us that and will have its effect in peculiar ways, both through how courts are appointed and through direct actions by legislatures in limiting on how broad the scope of the collective, the libertarian and the middle ground is. What I would ask, however, is that if we are realistic, we have to understand that all of them will be used, even when some could. And so one should ask empirically, which works best when? You know, when is it the case that the purely contractual gets pretty good results and you don't need any except for establishment of the entitlement in the first place of a collective uh, de determination of price when it is that the collective works best and when for any number of reasons the setting of the price at one level or another seems to work best and there will be way areas where one has a comparative advantage over the other and that's a profoundly empirical question and there will also be areas where none work well and then we have another problem and if I may just say something about that look at medical malpractice look at the attempt to get perfect medical care we all want it we care passionately about it and we can't possibly get it. As to the butcher, the doctor who really mangles us, almost everything works. Contract works, torts works, regulation works, criminal law, hang drawn, quarterum, anything works. And below that, nothing works. Nothing works because you don't have the knowledge that is essential to a contractual Things change too rapidly, which is essential instead. Uh, if you're going to have a regulatory system, it doesn't work well ever, but it works better and it's stable than in changeable things. And for any number of problems, anybody who's looked at any kind of non-fault or fault malpractice law knows that doesn't work. So there may be some things where you can say, we are constantly trying to make the best be the enemy of the good. It is the fact that people want more than they can get in this area. What can we do about it? Well, if we had realized that people at least wanted to have a certain level of uh, baseline compensation for people who were injured, and we wanted to have a subterfuge which looked as though we could go after doctors to make them behave better, but never did, but so that we could elude ourselves into thinking we were doing better, which was the old malpractice system, except we didn't give the compensation, that would have been perfectly good. We didn't have a compensation, and so we tried to use torts for that, and now in the United States we're in a horrible mess. Uh, the answer is, Look at that area and it's a mess and try to clean it up in one way. Look at other areas and try to do something else. Thank you very much again. Now I'm letting the floor to Alain and the two other speakers.